we continue our series on the life of Joseph. Now, if you've missed previous talks, this is actually number six. If you've missed previous talks, you can go to our website, mynorthgatechurch.com, and you can find them on the Watch Here uh, tab on our website. I invite you to do that. But if you've missed, you can still listen in and learn from this message today because really, all five previous messages really aren't necessary. They're just helpful. So I'm inviting you to be a part of that, and I'm glad you're here. In fact, I don't know that you could have picked a better Sunday to be here in this series on the life of Joseph. Because what I'm going to talk about, what I'm going to share with you this morning, I have been looking forward to since we planned doing this series. And the people around me will tell you that that we've been planning on this series of Joseph since after the first of the year. So this is, this is something I've really been looking forward to. And I'm so grateful that, uh, that, that we have this team of people and that we come together and we do these things because it is really so significant to look at these stories in the Old Testament. And I've encouraged you several times to, uh, to go to Genesis 37 to 50, I know that seems like a lot of chapters, but read it like you'd read a short story, okay? This is the life of an important person in the history of the Jewish people in particular, but for all of us, because of what he accomplished and the kind of leader that, that he was and how he displayed that leadership and how it worked. So I just want to encourage you to take advantage of this story and to read this story. Read it like a story. And I know some of you don't read. I get it. If you download the Bible app called the Version, you can let the Version read it to you. You don't have to read it on your own. So please, whatever it takes, listen to the story, would you? It's a terrific story about a man who literally changed his world and impacted the way we live today. A couple weeks ago, we talked about Joseph's life, and we reviewed the fact that all of life is all for God. All of life is all for God. One of the things that Joseph shows us is that everything we do, everything we do is worship. All of life is all for God. So it, it pulls us into his story and it teaches us that whether we're washing the dishes, whether we're baling hay, whether we're taking care of hogs out in the hog shed, whether we're changing a baby's diaper, whether we're working in a factory, no matter what we're doing, we're doing this for Jesus. As followers of Jesus, everything we do is worship. All of life is all for God. Last week, Levi shared, and I'm so grateful for Levi. I'm so grateful for Liz and Levi, for Chad, for Jerry, for the people that make up our, our staff team and our leadership team, because Levi so well tackled this subject last week, and he told the story of, of Joseph and Potiphar's wife, and he related it to the story of David and Bathsheba. And one of the things that Levi said last week that I just latched onto, we all laughed when he first said it, but the more I thought about it, the more meaning this statement has. Because he said, if you run from temptation, don't forget your clothes. And we all kind of laugh, just like we did now. And that's okay, but think of the depth of that statement. You know, one of the things that Joseph did is he got way too close to temptation before he ran. One of the things that, that David did with Bathsheba is he crossed the line. He didn't know when to run. This statement has a lot of depth to it because sometimes you and I have this tendency to get as close to sin as we can get without actually committing a sin. And we make a game out of it, and that's not the objective that God has laid out for us. That's not the way he chooses for us to live. That's our choice. So we, we look at these things from the life of Joseph and we say, okay, all this is great, but Joseph's entire story revolves around his dreams. He has these dreams. And as a kid, he had these dreams, and he learned, because of his experience, 
he learned that it was really dangerous to tell your brothers that one day they would all bow down to you. It was really not so cool to go to your dad and tell him your dream and say, yeah, even you and mom are going to bow down to me someday. Not, not cool. And, and we can learn from what Joseph did and, and didn't do in this whole process. And, and then he, has, he, he grows up, he matures, he has this experience in Potiphar's house. He becomes the leader of Potiphar's house. Potiphar said, I don't have to worry about anything except eating when Joseph is in charge. And then he was wrongfully accused of doing something. He's put in jail. In jail, he ends up being in charge of the jail. And these two king's officials, a cupbearer and a baker, are also thrown into prison. The king, Pharaoh becomes unhappy with them. So he throws them into prison, and they have these dreams. And Joseph hears about these dreams they're talking about. And he says, well, tell me these dreams. And they do, and he says, well, I can tell you what they mean. Now, man, I think the story leaves out a lot of things here. We have to kind of turn on our holy imagination to grasp this. Because what he says to the baker and the, and the cupbearer, well, it's not so nice. I mean, one of you is going to be restored to power. The other one of you is going to die. See ya. You know, that's kind of the way that the story reads, but there was so much more that I imagine happening in there. And, and guess what? It comes true. It comes true. And, and the process of this just kind of amazes us because we say, well, how did Joseph know that? How did God speak to Joseph, not only in his own dreams, but through the dreams of other people? And then we read later on in this story that Pharaoh has a dream. It's a recurring dream. It happens multiple times, and it bugs him, and he says, what does this mean? What does this mean? He calls together all the leaders, all the wise people, all the, all the counselors he can find and he says help me discover the meaning of this dream and nobody can tell him the meaning of the dream and then you know the one person who had joseph interpret a dream correctly says oh there was this guy i met him in prison how, i mean how many are you going to use that as a reference right <laughs> i met him in prison you ought to call him in see what kind of of interpretation he can give you because he told me what my dream was going to mean and he was right. Joseph is called in. He listens to Pharaoh's dream. He interprets it correctly. And we say, God, how, how is this? How is this? Now, I, I'm, I know, I know that you have dreams. And you have visions. I know that God speaks to you. Sometimes in dreams, sometimes in visions. You may not even realize it. But I know that God is speaking. And sometimes I'm convinced that we have kind of shoved God off to the side with all the technology that's come into our lives. Now, I'm not berating technology. I mean, anybody who knows me knows I love technology. I use technology. I leverage it all the time. Um, and I embrace the technology in my world. But I also recognize that that technology has a tendency of throwing cold water on my imagination, on my ability to hear not just words, but what's in between the words. It, it, it kind, of, kind of disables my mind from being able to see images that otherwise my imagination would come up with, but I depend on YouTube and the television and the movie screen and TikTok and Instagram, and everything else to give me the images so I don't have to think about it anymore. I, I can find the image. I mean, somebody said to me the other day, oh, I don't know how to, how to do a certain task. And I said, go search it on YouTube. There's a video about it. You know, and some of you have already experienced that. And we, we, we have a tendency to get so caught up in some of those things that we don't recognize that God really does speak to us. And then culture comes along, and everything around us says that we need to be happy, and God wants us to be happy. 
and we should just relax and be happy and follow your heart. You know, I, Liz talked about camp again this morning. We had a wonderful experience at camp. I love going to camp and being the camp pastor now. I directed it for 22 years. I don't have to do that anymore. I can just go there and be with people all day, sometimes for 20 hours a day, and, and listen to them and talk with them. But I came to the place at one point that week where I, I just openly said to people, if one more person tells me you're following your heart, I'm going to slug you. <laughs> you know, and they say, well, why aren't I supposed to follow my heart? No, look at what the prophet Jeremiah says. Look at what he says. The heart is hopelessly dark and deceitful, a puzzle that no one can figure out. And Jeremiah is quoting God here. God goes on and he says, but I, God, search the heart and examine the mind. He searches your heart and your mind. He searches my heart and my mind. He knows what drives us. He knows what our motivations are. If we, all we do is follow our heart, we are going to end up in a train wreck. That's the bottom line. Instead, God says, I get to the heart of the human. I get to the heart of every person. I get to the root of everything, and I treat them as they really are, not as they pretend to be. How many of you know how easy it is to live in your head? To have this this idea of how things, how things I, how I wish things were instead of how things really are, to pretend that events and situations and circumstances really didn't happen. I don't want to deal with it, so I'm going to pretend that never really happened. And God comes along and He says, "Hey, folks, I know your heart. I can see in your heart, and I know it's deceitful." And it's going to lead you astray. And, and we see that in the life of Joseph. Joseph, when he was younger, he had these dreams. And he shared them with people that had no business knowing about those dreams out of context. Because Joseph didn't even grasp those dreams. So Joseph followed his heart. He said, man, I had this dream. And one day, brothers, all of you are going to bow down and worship me. And, you know, his brothers reacted as brothers do. They threw him in a cistern and sold him into slavery. And how many times have you had a sibling that you wanted to do that to? How many times have you had a co-worker that you wish you could sell into slavery? How many times have you had a boss that you wish could be just sold into slavery, sell him to the Midianite, ship him off to Egypt, let's be done with this? You see, we, we, we live in a world where we kind of live in our heads a lot. And, and Jeremiah is telling us the words of the Lord. He says, you can't trust your heart. You can't live in your head. You can't follow your feelings. Your feelings are going to let you down. That's why, as Jesus followers... We come back over and over and over again to testing our feelings and testing our dreams. Now, um, I, I want to be really careful here because I know, I know how easy it is for Jesus followers to come to a conclusion in, in themselves, by themselves, without talking to a, to a group of people they're doing life with. I know how easy it is for us to say, well, God told me to, and you can fill in the blank. I'll never forget, I will never, ever forget this, this woman who walked into my office and sat down in the chair and she said, Jim, she says, uh, I, I just thought that I ought to tell you that um, God has told me it's okay for me to divorce my husband. Now, I, I knew this woman and don't, don't try to figure out who this is. This happened in, in 1986 in Bloomington, Indiana. All right? Just take it out of here completely. I knew her. I knew that the man she was married to 
was a second marriage, that she had lost her husband to an auto accident, he had lost his wife to cancer, the two of them met, they, they fell in love, they had an incredible uh, romantic relationship that led to marriage, and everybody around them rejoiced in this. It was wonderful to watch them. But they both had adult children when this happened. Their kids weren't little, they were adult children, and they could not agree on how to schedule holidays and special times and birthdays and what this kid was going to get for their anniversary and what this couple was going to get for their birthday and what we're going to do for Christmas over here. And that became such a big deal that it became an impasse and they decided we can't live with each other anymore and she came in and sat down in my office and says, I'm getting a divorce and God told me it was okay. Now, please, footnote, footnote. Sometimes divorce is necessary. Sometimes there are situations where it cannot be avoided. I get that. I'm not saying that. I'm saying in this situation, there was no immorality, there was no physical abuse, there was no emotional abuse. They just couldn't agree on how to treat their adult children that they shared. And she said, well, God told me it was okay to get a divorce. And I'm going to tell you, there's no place in the Bible where God gives, people to give, get, gives permission to, for people to get a divorce simply because they have a disagreement over something as non-essential as what kind of Christmas gift we're going to give this kid or how much time we're going to spend with this one over here. I'm sorry, those things, those things are just human relationship things that we have to learn to work out. And, and I, I want to be really careful here that we don't get into some kind of way of error where you're hearing me say, oh, Jim said, if I hear something from the God, I'm just, I'm just supposed to go do it. No, in fact, exact opposite. I'm going to give you a, a plan, a way to listen to God and respond to him. And it's biblical, it's not something I've made up because I'm a human being too and if left to my own devices, I would make some really, really bad decisions. This is what the Apostle John says. This is the John who followed Jesus. This is one of the boys who when he was fishing, Jesus came along and he said, come and follow me. And John not only writes a gospel, a story of Jesus' life, we call it the Gospel of John in the New Testament. But he writes three short letters to, to churches with advice and counsel. And in the first one of these letters, he has some very, very practical advice for you and me about listening to God, whether it be in dreams, visions, prayer, whatever it is. We, this is advice of how we listen to God. This is how he puts it. Dear friends, 1 John Chapter 4, starting at verse 1. Dear friends, don't believe every spirit. When, when you read this, don't believe every dream, don't believe every vision, don't believe every word from God that somebody tells you, don't believe everything that comes to your mind, don't believe every spirit. But, and it's a really important but, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Test the spirits. You say, well, Jim, how am I supposed to do that? How exactly am I supposed to test a spirit, a dream, a vision, a voice? How, how am I supposed to do that? And, and here is where, uh, here's where John gets very practical. He says, test the spirits to see whether they are from God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. That's why we have to do it. I'm telling you, my friends, Satan's primary job description is to deceive you. Satan's primary job description is to deceive you. Can I say it again? Satan's primary job description is to deceive you. Jesus himself says, and John records these words in chapter 10, verse 10 of his gospel. He says, Jesus says to us that Satan has come to kill and destroy. He's come to confuse us, to deceive us, to lead us astray. That is his job description. 
We have to be on alert. We have to be on our toes. We have to have sharpened ears. We have to have focused eyes. We have to have well-tuned hearts to hear God speak to us because, my friends, Satan's job is to deceive us. So Jesus, John says, there are many false prophets in the world, so you have to test the spirits. He goes on, this is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Listen up, listen up, this is how you do it. Right in 1 John 4, every spirit, dream, vision, voice, person that, that gives you advice, everything that comes into your life, all this input, every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Everyone. And yes, you should ask. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. Pretty plain and simple, but really hard to put into action in our lives. I know. I've been working on this for at least 40 years. So I'm going to share with you what I have, what I have learned. And, and first of all, I'm going to tell you that this is so important that I'm going to ask you not to write it down. Okay? I'm, not going, I'm going to ask you not to write it down. It's so important I've got a card prepared for you so that when you leave here today, you're going to each get a printed card. If you're watching us online... All you have to do is go to MyNorthgateChurch.com, use the contact tab, send us an email saying you want the PDF for, from this message today, and we will send that. You can load it, download it on your phone and have it with you all the time. And that goes for any of you that want the PDF. If you're in person, you don't want a piece of paper, you want, don't want a card, fine. You know, I will be happy to send it to you in a PDF form because it is that important that I want you to listen not write anything down right now, because this is really important. So how do we find meaning? How do we find meaning in dreams and visions? How do we find that meaning? How do you and I hear the voice of the Lord? How do we respond to the people and situations and circumstances around us like Joseph did and follow God and say, wow, God led, and I did not even ex expect for him to lead that way. Let me, let me just take you through some steps. And this is, this is all from Scripture, and I will give you the references at the end. They're printed on the card because I didn't make any of this up. All right, number one, pray in Jesus' name, asking God for discernment, and ask others to pray with you and for you. When you think you're hearing from God, when God is giving you a, a vision a dream, that he's speaking to you, you've read something in your word, you feel like God is giving you direction for your life, you're wondering about a job change, or you're wondering about where to go to school, or what your major should be, or who you should marry, all those things, ask people to pray with you and for you, and pray and ask God sincerely that he would give you wisdom and direction, insight, discernment. Next, remember it's not about you. It's not about you. Oh, you say, but it is. I want, I want to know who I should marry. I want to know what kind of job I should have. I want to know what major to have in school. It's not about you, folks. If you're a committed follower of Jesus, it's about God's kingdom working in you and through you. Because all of life is all for God. It's not about you. It's about God. If all you're doing is looking for your own personal fulfillment, ah, you're probably going to be very frustrated. But if you're saying, God, I want to know how I fit into what you're already doing. Ah, now you're on the right track. Now you're playing the right tune. Now the orchestra has a chance to join in with you with all that God has planned for you since before you were conceived. It's not about you. Next. When you have significant dreams and consistent visions, in other words, when it's happening multiple times, when you sense a spirit speaking to you, ask these two questions out loud. Ask these two questions out loud. Here they are. Number one, follow what, what John has said in 1 John 4. Ask the spirit. 
Ask the voice. Ask God if this dream, say, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he came to the earth in flesh and blood? My friends, you don't know how many times over the years when I have stopped to discern what I think God is saying to me, and I've asked this question in a flash. I don't even remember what I asked anymore. God just takes it away. The evil spirit, the, decept, the, the Satan who wants to deceive me, the deceiver doesn't want any part of Jesus Christ in flesh and blood. No way. No way does the evil spirit want any part of that. So off it goes. And sometimes I can even think of what I just asked God because it's just gone. The next part is you ask, are you the spirit of truth who leads in the will of God? You see, God... God has established his will for you. And I know some of you are saying, but I want to know what God's will is. He's already told you, all right? In Matthew 28, he's given every follower of Jesus our marching orders. He says, go out into all the world and make disciples. Make other followers of Jesus, teaching them everything I have taught you and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He's given all of you your job description. You know what God's will is for you. Now, how you carry that out, whether you go to work for Pella Window Corp or whether you go to work for JBS or whether you live in Oskaloosa or whether you move to Kansas City, God gives you a free will. And he says, you gather the people around you, gather the people that you do life with, gather the people that care about you and put them in a room and say, okay, now these are decisions of free will and I need to know what all of you think is best for me. That's how we make the decisions. We don't get paralyzed over, you know, i got to find God's will for my life. God's told you what his will is. He's given you his marching orders. He's called you to be faithful and obedient and humble. And he says, just go, go. Teach other people what it is to follow me. How you do that, where you do that, whether it takes this degree to communicate with this people or this this vocation over here, God says, you have a free will. He gives you and me a free will. And he allows us to make those choices. Next, pray in Jesus' name for ears to hear and a heart to understand. Does that look familiar from the first step? Yeah. This, this process is always bathed in prayer. Next, share the dream or vision with wise, mature Jesus followers and humbly ask for their insight. You notice this wasn't first on the list. This is, what, this is what I want to do so easily, okay? When I think I've had a dream or a vision, when I think God is leading and directing me, I want to go tell a whole bunch of people right away instead of waiting and praying and asking God for insight, and asking the, the spirit that I'm hearing, the dream that I'm having, the vision that's occurring, whatever I'm sensing in my life, do you, did Jesus Christ come in the flesh? Do you believe that, that he is the only way to God? You know, if I, if I fail to ask those questions before I go share it with other people, I risk making it about me and not about God. That's what my risk is. So share the dream or vision, but only after you've gone through all the previous steps. And, and let those people speak into your life. Let them speak into your life. Ask for their insight and wisdom. And when you're done, repeat. Often. Repeat the whole process. Often. And the, all of this that we've talked about, is taken directly from the, the, the Word of God. It's found in, the, let's put the references on the screen, it's found in 1 John 4, it's found in John 10, 10, it's found in Jeremiah 17, 5 through 10. It's, it's right there. All we're doing is practically applying what the Word of God already leads us into. That's all I've tried to do here for you. Because more than anything else, I want you to look for dreams and watch for visions. I believe God is speaking to you. 
I believe God has been speaking to you. I believe that sometimes we get like Moses. And I, I'm, I'm sure that when I get to heaven and I sit down to talk with Moses, I'm going to find out that when he finally went to see that burning bush and check it out in the desert, that it wasn't the first time he'd seen a burning bush. Because that's the way God works with me. That's the way God speaks to me. Over and over again, I find him trying to get my attention, and I'm not listening in the right way. I have to look for and watch for dreams and visions. God wants to do something really special in your life. God wants to do something unique with you. God wants to speak and, and, and lead you in ways that you don't even begin to fully grasp yet. Because he created you. He planned you. He knew that you would be sitting in that chair or sitting in your living room watching this online, where, sitting at your kitchen table, wherever you're watching this or experiencing this right now, he knew that you were going to be there before he created the world, let alone before you were conceived. He knew that you would be here. And he knew that I was going to share with this with you this morning. And I believe that he is led in this in every detail because he wants to speak to you. He wants to lead you. He wants to direct your life in ways that you have not even grasped yet. And he wants to do it so that he advances his kingdom. Because my friends, there is a dark, broken very caustic world out there that desperately needs Jesus. They need to know that he loves them. They need to know that there's nothing they could do to ever make him love them any less. They need to know there's nothing they could ever do that would make him love them more. They need to know that they belong here. And I'm, when we say that, we don't say that you belong at Northgate Church. You belong in the family of God, this household of faith, this group of believers that are gathered all over the world today, millions and millions of us, who love and worship God. And he calls us to follow him. And he wants to speak to us. He gives us dreams and visions and people around us. He speaks to us when we read his word. He speaks to us when we sing praise songs and worship songs to him. He speaks to us when we pray and we just have to listen because most of the time we get in such a hurry that we fail to connect with God who's already trying to speak to us. He wants to speak to you. He wants to have a relationship with you. That's why he created you. So, please, please, embrace this whole idea, okay? I, I want to remind you, Joseph is just a character, a real-life person in the history of Israel that we have a record of his life, but there was nothing any more special about Joseph than there is about you. God doesn't love you any differently than he loved Joseph. Joseph. And God has called you to lead a people, your family, your friends, your coworkers. God has called you to lead a people out of darkness and bondage into the light and follow Jesus. If you're not a follower of Jesus this morning, please talk to somebody around you. He, God has already placed people in your life that will help you cross that line. So if you're not a follower, find that help. Contact us at mynorthgatechurch.com, but find that help because we want you to join us in this journey, and we want you to hear from God in dreams and visions, in songs and prayer and relationships. Would you stand with me? I'd like to pray for you. I want to remind you that don't rush out the door too fast because we have a card for you with what we just shared uh, because that's how important this was, that we wanted to prepare that card for you this morning. Heavenly Father, I pray for each individual who can hear my voice, who can see me on a screen. I pray that you would help these people to embrace the power of your Spirit, to speak to them and lead them and guide them no matter what. I pray that you defeat Satan, who wants to deceive us and distract us 
and get us off on detours and cause destruction in our lives, may, may Satan be defeated. And may we follow you with all our hearts, with all our minds, with all our souls. And we pray this for the glory and in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.